Well, good morning and thank you for being here. I, I am delighted to be part of this conference, although this is going to be a radical change from a, a lot of the talks we've heard, at least in, in context. I, but the, the message that we're not at sustainability is going to be very consistent. So the oceans uh, pose so a difficult problem for reaching sustainability for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, we are radically changing the ocean environment, and that's actually difficult to convince people that it is happening, uh, but we are doing it. And second of all, we know very little about marine environments. Uh, compared to what we know on land, which ecologists will tell you is not enough, we know drastically less about what's going on uh, with uh, marine ecosystems. And so defining what we mean by sustainability has always been hard for the oceans, and climate change is only going to make it harder. What we can agree on, I think, is a goal, which is we'd like to maintain at least some uh, healthy ocean ecosystems. And uh, enjoy these photos. They're the last pretty ones you're going to get to see for a few minutes. But uh, some basics on the oceans and why we should care about them. They cover 71% of the world's surface, but they provide 99% of the space available worldwide uh, for life. And one challenge for marine sustainability, as I already mentioned, is how little we know. And one of my favorite quotations uh, comes from Colin Woodward on the subject, basically summarizing, we know more about the moon and Mars than we know about what's going on in the oceans. And the farther away from the coast you go, the more that is true. However, we do know enough to know that oceans are very value, valuable both economically and in terms of biodiversity. So uh, economically, I'm just going to pull out one study, uh, a study that got a lot of attention, came out in Nature in 1997 by Robert Costanza and his colleagues, uh, estimating that the world's ecosystem services were median estimate worth $33 trillion. Uh, I am not going to debate the accuracy of that number. What's important for my purposes is if you look at their breakdown of where those ecosystem services come from, about 63% of the estimated value of the world's ecosystem services come from marine ecosystems. So almost two thirds from the marine environment. And of that two thirds, about 60% of that is from coastal ecosystems. And we're talking about things like uh, coastal surge protection, but also basic provisions such as food in the form of seafood. So if you think about that, coastal ecosystems are about 6.3% of the world's surface area uh, and providing about 43% of the world's total value of ecosystem services. These and all marine ecosystems are things we should care about economically. But also in terms of, of biodiversity, and uh, a lot of the figures I'm going to take are from UNESCO, but if you're thinking in terms of biodiversity, there's a lot of different ways to think about biodiversity. You think about species biodiversity, you think about genetic biodiversity. When you're thinking about the oceans, you should really think in terms of the very fundamental variety of life forms that exist on the Earth. Uh, if you remember back to when you were first learning biology in elementary school, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I, I want to focus on phyla, the second, second classification order down. A lot of variety between phyla. You're looking at some, some very uh, profound genetic differences. There's over 70 phyla that have been recognized. 43 of them are found in the oceans. Only 28 are found on land. So if you're thinking in terms of large variations in biodiversity, uh, the oceans are where it's at. Now beyond that, about 45% of the known phyla for organisms exist only in the oceans. So again, if you're looking for biodiversity, uh, the oceans are where it's at. And 90% of the known classes, which is the next order down of classification, are marine. So a lot of economic value, a lot of biodiversity value uh, in the oceans. 
So what's been going on with the oceans that threatens sustainability? Uh, I will just say up front, we are not using the oceans sustainably. We're not anywhere close. Uh, but overfishing is generally considered the biggest, the primary threat to marine biodiversity, uh, especially when the fishing methods involved also destroy habitat, and, and the primary example of that is trawling, uh, which destroys uh, bottom habitat, but there are other methods that destroy it as well. Uh, and as you can see, the global marine catches of fish kind of peaked in the late 80s and have been declining ever since. It's an indication that worldwide the systems are overstressed uh, or overfished. And that was confirmed uh, by a lot of research summed up in this New York Times uh, diagram where uh, high percentages of the world's fisheries are either collapsing, uh, just about to collapse, or barely, barely sustainable in the sense that they are fully exploited. Uh, so, uh, not a good sign for uh, the, the uh, oceans. Uh, the Food and Agricultural Organization has estimated that over 70% of the world's fish species are either fully exploited or depleted. Uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment identified capture fisheries as one of the two ecosystem services that are already being used at levels that are way beyond sustainability even for current demand and will continue to be completely unsustainable uh, given future demands. Now this is a problem not just for biodiversity but for humans as well because fish are a source of food, especially of protein. Uh, overall, um, the world's fisheries, and that includes aquaculture and freshwater fisheries, make up about 10% of human caloric intake, but that uh, overall statistic masks the fact that seafood is actually a very important source of protein in many areas of the world. Uh, fisheries are likely to continue to decline for some re time to come, and this is going to be an especially important uh, problem in terms of food supply uh, in Africa and Southeast Asia in particular. So, uh, not a good system. The other thing that happens with overfishing is you get something called fishing down the food web. Uh, the original preferred target species are the large apex predators at the top of the food web. Uh, the big things like tuna and swordfish. Uh, and as those get overfished, fishers switch effort to species farther down the food web uh, and start fishing for species that would have been considered trash fish, sometimes as little as a decade earlier. So, what else do we have going on out there? Uh, we have pollution contaminating species. Uh, most prominent mercury advisories are, are very common in the United States now. By 2001, 58% of the U.S. coastline was under mercury uh, consumption advisories, fish consumption advisories. In March 2004, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration uh, issued it an advisory on mercury and seafood, uh, advising pregnant women and children in particular not to consume shark, swordfish, tilefish, or king mackerel. Uh, those are the marine species out of other species because of the mercury content in them. Uh, there are, this is true for other toxics as well. Uh, PCBs, for example, uh, bioaccumulate because they dissolve in fat. And we are creating situations where the top species in the food web, which by the way includes us, uh, are bioaccumulating toxins in their fat. Uh, there are actually certain populations of marine mammals that have such a high concentration of toxics in their fat that they qualify as hazardous waste. So. Uh, what else have we got uh, going on? This is not going to be a fun talk, all right? Uh, we have pollution causing dead zones. I, and uh, a lot of marine pollution, in fact, about 77% of it comes from the land, which is not 
something most people clue into. And we have an increasing number of dead zones. Now dead zones happen, as we heard yesterday, when you have fertilizers, particularly nitrogen, running down into the oceans. Nitrogen actually also gets carried by air currents and deposited into the oceans. Uh, that nitrogen is a fertilizer. Marine plants like it just as much as land plants do, and they start blooming. Uh, you get algal blooms, some of which are toxic, some of which aren't. But eventually they run out of nitrogen and die, and as they die and decompose, they use up pretty much all of the oxygen in the water, uh, creating hypoxic zones, or as they are more popularly known, dead zones. And the things that can flee the dead zone do, the things that can't die. Uh, and uh, this map should, I hope, be a little startling. These are the dead zones around the world. Uh, the number of dead zones in the world seas has doubled every decade since 1960 as a result of increasing pollution. As of uh, 2005, uh, UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, had counted 146 persistent dead zones around the world. Uh, the one that, if you are familiar with this phenomenon at all, you probably know a lot about is the Gulf of Mexico dead zone, which is one of the largest. It can cover more than 7,000 square miles uh, because it's at the end of the Mississippi River, which drains 41% of the United States, including a lot of farmland. Uh, it's about 1.6 million tons of nitrogen going into the Gulf of Mexico from the Mississippi River every year, uh, which is three times as much as only 40 years ago. However, the world's biggest dead zone, and it's actually a dead sea, is the uh, Baltic Sea, uh, where you got both sewage and nitrogen uh, falling out of the sky from power plants, uh, as well as fertilizers uh, combining to basically render the sea dead. So that's also what we've got going. What else do we have? Something recently discovered is we have garbage collecting in the gyres of the ocean. Pretty much every ocean has a place where the currents kind of circulate around that's called a gyre. Uh, the largest of these is in the Pacific Ocean and we have ended up with the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. This is an area currently thought to be about twice the size of Texas where all the plastic from everywhere. And they've traced some of it to Japan, they've traced some of it to China, they've traced some of it to the United States. Uh, but all the plastic from everywhere rimming the Pacific Ocean, including plastic uh, discarded at sea, uh, kind of makes its way through the current system to this gyre where it collects in a wide field. And what that field looks like on top is that. Uh, it is uh, just out there floating huge. Uh, the Hawaiian Islands, the north northwestern Hawaiian Islands uh, get dumped on uh, on the beaches, huge cleanup days. Now as ugly as that looks, that's not actually the worst of the problem because plastic that large you can actually go through and skim and get. What also happens is in the oceans is between the salt water and the sunlight, plastic starts breaking down into very fine granules. Now it doesn't get processed, it doesn't go away, but it becomes very, very, very fine grain plastic, uh, about the size and density of plankton. And what you have right under that surface layer is a plastic soup. If you pull up a beaker of it, you will see all sorts of particles of sometimes brightly colored, sometimes clear plastic floating around in it. At the last estimate, the ratio of plastic to plankton is six to one. Okay, more, six times more plastic in there than plankton. But it looks like plankton. And a lot of plastic looks like food. And what is also going on around the, the Great Pacific garbage patch is that all sorts of animals, birds, marine mammals, fish, are being found that have literally starved to death because they are packed with plastic. If you cut them open, they are basic plastic. Now, that's not fun enough. Uh, the other thing that you get in the, these Great Pacific Garbage Patch, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is the largest one. There's four others. 
four other places in the ocean where you have these gyres and the, and the plastics are, are collecting. Uh, you have these fun little plastic pellets that are called nurdles. I don't know who came up with that name, N-U-R-D-L-E-S, nurdles. Uh, but they're little plastic pellets, and what it turns out that nurdles are really good at, besides floating in these gyres, is absorbing other toxic stuff that's in the ocean. So they basically attract the toxics that are in the ocean to them, which sounds like a good thing, except again, they look like food. So they have become another transportation mechanism for getting the toxics that are in the ocean into the food web. All right, so what is climate change going to add to all this? Well, nothing good, basically. Uh, first of all, you're going to get increasing ocean temperatures. Uh, this was an early project projection. Temperature increases have been measured in the ocean to one mile down. It starts at the ocean air interface and, and the temperatures increase downward uh, over time. Uh, those temperature increases have been now found one mile down. As of June 2008, it was becoming clear that the ocean temperatures uh, associated with climate change are already 50% beyond what the IPCC projected in 2007. So there are, we're already getting hotter oceans than was thought that we would get. Uh, and species in general are temperature specific, fairly temperature specific. They like certain temperature ranges and they won't stay when the waters warm up. So what we are already seeing is migration of ocean species from hotter areas to cooler areas, basically toward the poles and away from the equator. Now the species that like the poles, you notice, as is true for most things in climate change, the poles are warming up the most, uh, and the species at the poles have nowhere to go. They, their, their environment is becoming literally too hot for them to live in. Uh, and this has been measured in a lot of species, but this was one recent study that just came out on cod. Uh, cod are moving north what cod are left, there aren't that many, but the cod are moving north, uh, this is the, the eastern coast of, of Canada. Uh, so, and other species are as well. Now some of the projected effects, uh, if you've got species migrating around and uh, unlike land, there's very few real barriers in the ocean. So if species want to move, they tend to move. Uh, if species want to move, you're going to change food webs, you're going to change the dominant species in various areas. Uh, you can also end up with fish depletion. Like I said, everything is trying to leave the tropics. Uh, the tropics may end up being virtually fishless uh, as a result of ocean temperatures increasing. Uh, fishing ranges are changing. Now that influences, if you're thinking about terms of fishing regulation, uh, especially if you're in state waters in the United States, uh, if the target species are no longer where they're supposed to be, the, the whole question of who gets to regulate and how could become problematic. And again, uh, some species likely to go extinct either because the, of the shifts in uh, ecosystems and food webs or because, like I said, at the poles, they simply don't have habitat left. All right, what else is climate change bringing? Well, changes in ocean currents is projected and happening. Now, the one you've probably heard about because it was exploited in the day after tomorrow, if nothing else, uh, is the whole thermal haline circulation pattern, thermo heat driven, haline salt driven. Uh, this is what keeps temperatures fairly moderate in Europe, for example. Basic idea, hot water from the tropics goes up to the poles where it's cooled down, sinks to the bottom, comes back down, and you get a, a strong circulation pattern that influences weather events all over the world. Uh, as ocean temperatures change and as the differential between the equator and the poles evens out, as sea ice melts, as glacier melts, and the saline content changes, one projected outcome is that this circulation just breaks down and that probably not as fast as the day after tomorrow, but that could have some real implications for uh, weather 
all over the world. Uh, but I, it doesn't have to be that dramatic. If you actually, if you ever want to scare yourself silly, read Under a Green Sky by Peter Ward. It gets into that particular scenario uh, in great and horrifying detail. But uh, it doesn't have to be that big. It doesn't have to be that dramatic to start disrupting ocean ecosystems. And one of the things that's happening on the West Coast is that a lot of upwellings, the upwellings where the cold, nutrient-rich water from the bottom of the ocean comes to the surface, generally considered a good thing, where you have natural upwellings, you have a lot of fish concentrations. Uh, if you've seen the National Ge Geographic movies off the coast of Alaska, where all the fish are and the marine mammals are, and the whales come in, uh, that's an upwelling site. So these are, are, are great regions for food production, for fishery production, for biodiversity, uh, but they're moving, and they're changing. And they're moving because as you change air temperatures and you change ocean temperatures, you change winds and you change currents and therefore you change the locations of where these upwellings are occurring. You also change, in, in, at least off the west coast, the strength of the upwelling. And what is, uh, was discovered off of the west coast was a dead zone that no one could explain. Uh, this isn't a typical dead zone where you say, okay, it's the nutrient pollution coming in causing the dead zone. Uh, what it looks like is going on with that West Coast dead zone is that the upwelling has become so strong. So many nutrients are being brought up from the bottom because of changes in wind patterns and ocean patterns, uh, circulation patterns, that it is in effect acting like having fertilizer dumped there. You're getting the same boom and bust because of the increased upwelling as you could get from nutrient pollution coming off the land. So like I said, it doesn't have to be the, the big bad overall change. Uh, the one that actually scares me the most, because uh, we are changing the ocean's chemistry, which is a mind-boggling thought, but nevertheless it's happening, uh, is ocean acidification. As we heard yesterday, uh, the oceans are the world's largest carbon sink. They take in carbon dioxide. They have been taking in a lot of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere as atmospheric concentrations have increased. Uh, that changes the chemistry of the ocean, especially at the surface. Uh, the, the carbon dioxide breaks down and eventually you get acids, uh, carbonic acid among others. Now the ocean is naturally basic. It has a pH usually of about 8.4, 8.5. That's been the same for hundreds of thousands of years as far as anyone can tell. Uh, but that pH globally on average has already gone up about 0.1 pH units, projected to go up between 0.4 or 0.6, which might not sound like a lot except that the pH scale is logarithmic, so that 0.1 one change in pH units is actually a 26% increase in hydrogen uh, ions. So uh, this is the, the kind of map of where we were a few years ago, uh, the, the uh, ocean acidification going on, and why it matters is uh, for several reasons. Again, we're changing the basic environment that uh, species live in, uh, including phytoplankton and plankton that are, are sensitive. This is actually a, a major of argonite saturation, which I won't go into, but it's important for coral reefs. And as you can see, by the end of the century, uh, the areas of the world that are projected to be able to support coral reefs are basically non-existent. Uh, so corals are very sensitive to this, mollusks are very sensitive to this. Uh, the little, uh, anything that has a calcium carbonate shell tends to be fairly sensitive to this, uh, including the plankton that float on the top of the ocean. And at this point I will mention, a uh, fact you might not have known, phytoplankton in the ocean produce about 50% of the world's ocean, or oxygen in the atmosphere. So you start messing with their ability to live and all of us are in trouble. Uh, now, species do differ. It's been discovered that certain critters like lobsters and crabs can in fact go ahead and keep processing uh, calcium carbonate even in an ac acidified environment. But mollusks, corals, plankton seem to have a much tougher time with it. 
And uh, this care of the National Geographic is a projection of what ocean acidification would mean uh, for a typical reef at various concentrations of atmospheric carbon dioxide and you get the combination of the temperature increase in there as well. Now coral get the double whammy, they're, they're sensitive to temperature increase, they're sensitive to the acidification and the projections are not good for the, the survival of coral as a group of species, but this is the projection. So, the title of my talk, Is the Future Really a Jellyfish Sea? Uh, the message, like I said, that I want to convey is that we are many, 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 many steps away from anything that we should cons consider sustainable with regard to the oceans. Uh, and, and when we're talking in terms of trying to become sustainable, our first goal really should be to ensure that we have something other than jellyfish at the other side of whatever the other side of climate change is. Uh, this is a, a photo from the Black Sea. This is what the Black Sea had become. Uh, is a polluted sea of jellyfish. Uh, it had once supported a complex ecosystem that included pike, sturgeon, seagrass nurseries, kelp forests, and monk seals, all gone. This is what's left. This is the projected future of continued unsustained use of the oceans. This is the jellyfish sea. Uh, now what happened in the Black Sea is a combination of things. That's pretty much true for everywhere in the oceans. Overfishing, oil spills, industrial discharges, nutrient pollution, wetlands destruction, and the introduction of alien species, including the jellyfish themselves. So um, that's where you end up with. What does that look like as a matrix for things to think about? Well, this is a, a fairly common diagram of how to think about sustainability uh, beyond the basic definition. You have the intersection of the environmental, uh, the social, and the economic. Uh, basically, we're doing poorly on all three uh, from uh, the environmental side, we have very poor management of the oceans, even in the United States. Our laws are chaotic, uh, fragmented. Uh, the ocean-land interface in particular is very poorly dealt with under American law, and we at least have laws on the books. When you get out beyond national jur jurisdiction, enforcement of anything is incredibly difficult. It's a huge huge, vast expanse of water. Uh, and then we have the new climate change stressors going on that, face it, we still don't have a world plan for dealing with uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. So uh, on the environmental side, very stressed, very poorly managed. It is the last great commons and is suffering all the tragedies associated therewith. I, we have, again, limited understanding of what's needed, what could be done, what's even out there. Uh, you get uh, millions of differences in the, the number of species that are estimated to be in the ocean. Uh, uh, researchers will be off by or range over a course of millions, uh, not just not knowing what's out there. But socially, there's great need for the coastal resources in particular, uh, for coastal fisheries, for uh, coastal uh, wetlands, for coastal habitat, and hence that limited understanding and the great immediate need have interacted very poorly uh, for sustainable oceans management. And then on the economic side, uh, as is true with many natural resources, there's been a, an emphasis on the short term, uh, short term gain, no long term planning, uh, and we've seen the results, of, particularly in fisheries. All that adds up to not sustainable. So. To end on a hopefully uh, brighter note, what could we do to come up with something other than the jellyfish sea? Uh, well, first of all, we need to get serious about keeping all forms of pollution out of the ocean. Like I said, worldwide, in the United States included, the interface of land and sea is very poorly dealt with. 
uh, if, even if you chart, talking in terms of water quality and the Clean Water Act, even though the Clean Water, Water Act technically extends the oceans, it's very rarely been applied to the oceans. So we need to work on getting all forms of pollution out of the ocean. That really does mean focusing on the land-sea interface. Uh, because 77% of the pollution in the ocean does come from land, either by runoff uh, through waterways or from atmospheric deposition from land-based activities. Uh, there's actually pretty good controls on ocean dumping worldwide. That's not as much of a problem. Marine shipping could be improved, but it's a relatively small problem. And if you say marine pollution, you probably come up with an image of an oil spill. That's really so little of the problem. Uh, that it, it's a very small sliver of that par pie chart. Uh, we need to employ a hyper-precautionary principle in fishing regulation. Uh, we have not employed uh, anything approaching a precautionary uh, principle in fishing regulation. If you've been paying attention to the news this week, this is very politically difficult to do uh, anywhere, <laughs> including in the United States. If you've been paying attention to the news this week, there have been all sorts of stories about how the Obama administration is going to shut down fishing in all of uh, the U.S. O ocean waters. This is uh, coming out of the Ocean Policies Task Force uh, idea of zoning the oceans, which I'll talk about in the, uh, in the moment. Uh, but the idea that we might want to not fish as much is a, is a politically difficult and, and in many places of the world economically and socially difficult uh, challenge to overcome, but nevertheless, uh, that is one of the key drivers of unsustainability in the oceans. Uh, now, we're stuck with the CO2 for quite a while, uh, at least decades and, and probably centuries, even if we cut all greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow, the CO2 is going to be around for a while. The oceans are going to keep uh, absorbing it. The heat impacts are going to be there for a while. So we're kind of stuck with those two, but one, uh, and if you were at the land connectivity talk uh, in the last session, uh, similar idea in the oceans is to create lots of marine protected areas, let the species migrate, protect what habitat you can. Uh, and this is actually part of uh, the interim framework for effective coastal and marine uh, coastal and marine spatial planning uh, document that was released in December 2009, again coming out of the Ocean Policy Task Force, uh, planning to do spatial planning of the United States' marine, uh, marine areas on a large marine ecosystem scale. Uh, what's not clear from that document is how many of, of these zones would actually be fully protected. Uh, recommended percentage for biodiversity purposes usually comes in at about 20 percent, and it's not at all clear to me that the recreational fishers have all that much to worry about that will come anywhere near 20 percent, but it, that is something that needs to be done. And then, uh, most important, the mental adjustment is we need to admit that our old no notions of ocean sustainability don't work anymore if they ever did. The oceans have historically been viewed as uh, in a freedom of the seas kind of paradigm, a paradigm of inexhaustibility. There's no way that puny humans could injure the oceans in any great way. They're just too big, too vast. We know that's not true anymore. Uh, and even if we don't know what we should be aiming for, we know what we're doing is not the right path. And so we do need to realize that we can do and will change marine ecosystems and the services they provide for some time in the future and change. <laughs>